Hello, I'm Scott Whipperman, the pastor here at First Presbyterian Church. And no matter who you are or where you are in your journey of faith, know that you're welcome here. We hope you enjoy today's service on this video, and we invite you to come join us for worship anytime that you would like, or join us in any of the other activities of the church. For more information about First Presbyterian Church, please visit our website at fpchelena.com or call us at 442-4775. God bless. Our second reading is from the Gospel of John, chapter 4, verses 3 through 42. Jesus is leaving Judea and going north to Galilee. I share these words with you from the Common English Bible, which will be different um, than what you see on your screen. Let us hear the living word of the Lord. Jesus left Judea and the south and went north to Galilee. Jesus just had to go to Samaria. He came to a Samaritan city called Sychar, which was near the land Jacob had given to his son Joseph. Jacob's well was there, and Jesus was tired from his journey, so he sat down at the well, and it was about noonday. And a Samaritan woman came to the well to draw water, and Jesus said to her, Give me a drink of water. And his disciples had gone into the city to buy some food for him, and the Samaritan woman asked him, Excuse me? Are you talking to me? Why do you, a Jewish man, ask for something from me, a Samaritan woman? For Jews and Samaritans don't associate with each other. And Jesus responded, If you recognized God's gift, and who is saying to you, Give me a drink, you would be asking him, and he would give you living water. The woman said to him, hmm, Sir, you have no bucket, and the well is deep. Where do you get this living water from? Are you greater than our father Jacob? He gave us this well, and he drank from it himself, as did his sons and his livestock. And Jesus answered her, Everyone who drinks this water will be thirsty again, but whoever drinks from the water that I give will never be thirsty again. The water that I give will spring up and become a bubbling up to eternal life. And the woman said to him, Sir, give me this water so that I will never be thirsty or never need to come back here for water. Jesus said to her, Well, just go and get your husband and then just come back here. And the woman replied, I don't have a husband. And he said, You're right. You don't have a husband. Jesus answered, You've had five husbands and the man you're with now isn't your husband. You've spoken the truth. And the woman said, Sir, I see you are a prophet, and our ancestors worshipped on this mountain, but you and your people say that it's necessary to worship over there in Jerusalem. And Jesus said to her, Believe me, woman, the time is coming when you and your people will worship the Father neither on this mountain nor in Jerusalem. You and your people worship what you do not know. We worship what we know because salvation is from the Jews. But, but, time is coming. It's here. And when true worshipers will worship in spirit and in truth, the Father looks at those who worship him in this way. God is spirit, and it is necessary to worship God in spirit and truth. And the woman said, I know, I know the Messiah is coming, and the one who's called the Christ, when he comes, will teach us everything. And Jesus said to her, I am, I am, I am the one who speaks to you. And just then, Jesus' disciples arrived and they were shocked that he was talking to a woman. But no one asked, what do you want? Why are you talking with her? The woman put down the jar and she went into the city. And she said to the people, come and see a man who's told me everything I have ever done. Could this man be the Christ? And they left the city, and they were on their way to see Jesus. But, but in the meantime, the disciples spoke to Jesus, saying, Rabbi, eat something. And Jesus said to them, I have food you don't know anything about. And the disciples asked each other, Has someone brought to him some food while we were away? And Jesus said to them, I am fed by doing the will of the one who sent me, by completing his work. 
Don't you have a saying, four more months and then it's harvest? Look, I tell you, open your eyes and notice that the fields are already ripe for the harvest. Those who harvest are receiving their pay and gathering fruit for eternal life. So those who sow and those who harvest can now celebrate together. This is a true saying, that one that sows and another harvest. But I have sent you to harvest what you didn't work hard for and others worked hard for, and you're going to share in their hard work. Well, many Samaritans in the city believed in Jesus because of the woman's words when she testified, he told me everything I had ever done. So when the Samaritans came to Jesus, they asked him to stay with them, abide with us, and he abided there two days. Many more believed because of his word, and they said to the woman, we no longer believe because of what you said to us. For we've heard for ourselves, and we know that truly he must be the Savior of the world. The living word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. I want to invite you this morning, Helena, to look around you. And These are beautiful stained glass windows, but you all knew what it was like to get here this morning. It's treacherous out there. It's really, really snowy. And so these words from Jesus today are daring. Look around you, Helena. It's harvest time. That's what Jesus says. Look at your fields. Look at your neighborhood. It's harvest time. This is the declaration that Jesus makes to his disciples in Samaria after encountering a woman at the well in John's gospel. But it's also God's word for us. But how can this be, Jesus? Don't you see the snow, the frost, making these roads treacherous on the ground? And like us, the disciples wonder if Jesus has had a mental leave of absence. And they look out over the fields in clear view surrounding this well, and they're puzzled, and rightly so. These fields are not ripe for the harvest. The shoots are barely cracking the earth. Perhaps it's under a deep layer of snow or frost. And it's only beginning to make a fragile attempt at life. Perhaps the seeds are in the ground, but nothing else, Jesus. But Jesus says the fields are ripe for the harvest. In the gospel, I see Jesus reaching the edges. I see Jesus reaching the edges of the field. The parts that are not taken in by columbines, right? If you're a farmer, you have a columbine, there will be some grain on the edge that just doesn't get harvested, right? That's what Jesus' ministry is all about. He goes to those edges, and he gets what hasn't been taken up, what's been left to rot, perhaps. On my first trip over the divide when Clayton and I moved to Montana about seven years ago, I was warned by others in the car to steer clear of browning. And when I asked the question to the kids in skateboarding and serious juju, where they steer clear of, they told me, Evergreen, if you've been to Kalispell, they told me Deer Lodge, uh, Columbia Falls, the Outlaw Inn, and uh, the Blue and White Motel in town. And some might also recommend steering clear of juju, since it's full of those kinds of kids. But where are the ripe fields? Let's start by joining Jesus as he detours from his ordinary route. Our scripture says that Jesus traveled north to Galilee, and Jesus just had to stop in Samaria. Really, Jesus, you didn't have to stop in Samaria. No one has to stop in Samaria. That is why you pack a lunch, and you fill up ahead of time so you don't have to stop, right? No one wants to stop here. You bypass that thing or something. Jesus can really be so annoying. Can't Jesus just be annoying? Jesus takes us to places we don't want to go. We don't have to stop there. The place used to be bustling, right? In Samaria and Saqqar is a bustling, sacred, prime real estate. But all of that changes with time. Saqqar is now abandoned when Jesus arrives and all the good Jewish people with it. Jesus sits down at the well. It's about noonday. The disciples are irritated that he had to stop, and they're hungry, and they're eager to get the show on the road. So they leave to go find food. They leave him at the well. Have you ever left at the wrong time and you just missed everything? You know what it's like to leave at the wrong time? So a woman walks up to the well, and she's alone, and it's not particularly safe nor reasonable to carry water during the high heat of noonday sun, but here she is. And perhaps she's an introvert, and she just needed some time away. Perhaps there's a reason she doesn't want to talk with anybody. Perhaps she's had a falling out with her family and her friends. We can relate to that. Whatever the case, she's expecting to be alone and safe. 
And yet here in front of her is a Jewish man blocking her way to the well. If it weren't for the water, she might have just turned back. And her heart beats a little faster as she approaches, trying not to disturb the water, not disturb the peace. Give me a drink of water, the man asked. Excuse me? Are you seriously talking to me? You are a Jewish man. I am a Samaritan woman. We don't talk. Jesus has all the power in this exchange. He is male and he's Jewish. She has none. She has none. She's a woman and a Samaritan at that. She has two strikes against her. Samaritan woman. And there are lots of people who have two strikes against them, right? A black man, an illegal immigrant, a California home buyer, <laughs> right? A drug dealer, a drug user, these are two strike people, right? A transgender youth, fake media, right? A Trump supporter, maybe on the other side, a nasty woman, if you want to go back and forth, a Samir- Samir- uh, Syrian refugee, a young skater, those are two strike people. A child molester? Eek! Who else carries two strikes against them today? Our morals may keep us from talking to these people like they're human beings, but Jesus' morals don't. Ruth is also a Moabite immigrant. She is by definition an outsider, one outside the reach of God's care and outside the reach of God's covenant blessing. Ruth is a foreign woman. Without a documentation, she is clinging to a mother-in-law who's returning home simply to die. Her prospects are grim. Ruth is young, and she doesn't want to die. She wants to live. And like many teens today, with a parent unable to provide, Ruth knows that she must become the breadwinner to survive. So Ruth chapter 2, verse 2. Ruth the Moabite said to Naomi, Let me go to the field so that we may glean and eat the ears of grain behind someone in whose eyes I I might find favor. Kiana at Sirius Juju is an emancipated teenager. And she said, The story of Ruth is our story. Skaters are like the fruit and the grain that drops to the ground and it's ignored and we're rotting. But God comes behind like Ruth, and he gleans and picks us up out of the mud, making something redeeming out of our lives. Jesus asked the Samaritan woman for a drink of water. If you only knew the generosity and who it was asking you for a drink, you would instead ask him for water, and he'd give you living water. She doesn't know if he is off his meds or what, but she simply points out that he has no bucket. And that this well is very deep, so deep, it's kept a community alive for centuries. Everyone who drinks of this water will be thirsty again, Jesus tells her. Yeah, that's how it works, she thinks. But whoever drinks of the water I give will never be thirsty again. Hmm. Sir, give me this water so that I never will have to be thirsty or keep coming back here a day in and day out. Aren't we tired of returning to the same empty wells, empty routines, empty rituals, unsatisfying rat race that leaves you exhausted and thirsty? Sir, give me this water and I will never be thirsty again or need to keep coming back here. Then Jesus says something very rude. Bring your husband to the well and I'll give you this water. Just rude. Jesus, why did you have to bring up a husband? No one was talking about a husband. And in a split moment, the woman at the well has to ask herself, can I trust this man? And for the women in this room, we've all asked this question to ourselves. Can I trust this man? Now when someone asks something of you you don't want to answer, a story that you don't want to tell, you have to give the short truth or the real truth, right? You have to make a split-second decision. Short truth or real truth? So truth light, 
the answers we quickly give when socializing at a party with new faces or the real truth, which could take a couple of hours and it's kind of messy. We make quick calculations all the time of being safely true or truly honest. Life is messy. And the Samaritan woman offers the safe truth to Jesus. I have no husband. And Jesus responds, you're right. You have no husband. Indeed, you've had five husbands, and the one you're with now isn't your husband. That is the full, messy, slut-shaming truth. And for centuries, preachers and commentators on this text have slut-shamed the woman at the well for the full truth that Jesus uncovers. But ask yourself, did she really choose to have five husbands and now live with a man with no rights to her name? Did she? Do we have any similar suspicions about the six men along the way, what their behaviors were or their intentions towards her? What is gospel, what is surprising, is Jesus remains right here at this point in the story. That is what is absolutely astonishing. He stays in relationship, even after hearing the full truth. God incarnate does not walk away. Well, if this Jewish man is going to ask me about my marital status, she thinks, I might as well poke the bear and ask about his religious status. So she says, you say that the only true place is to worship in Jerusalem at First Presbyterian Church and Town Center, right? Or a Protestant church or the mega church, whatever it may be, that's where people flood into, right? They wouldn't welcome people like me there. So tell me, is that the only true place to worship Jesus? And it's time for Jesus to answer. And he says, believe me, the time is coming when you and your people will neither worship on this mountain nor in Jerusalem. Salvation is from the Jewish story, but the time is coming. It's happening now when true worshipers won't be caught up in the battle of temples or mountains or denominations or sanctuaries, but will rather worship God in spirit and in truth. Thanks to the vision of the Peace USA, through this pledge of 1,001 new worshiping communities, a small fledgling skateboard ministry resurrected, and it found a new home in another warehouse, downtown Kalispell. And since October 6, 2016, I've had the privilege of serving Serious Juju Skateboard Ministry. The privilege, though, gosh, I'm learning so much on the fly. We're an indoor skate park, a food ministry, a Christian ministry. We're a sanctuary and a refuge for kids that live on the knife edge. For many, their lives could fall either way, towards life or towards death. And a crew spanning from evangelicals to progressive liberals all serve together as volunteers in this ministry. We're not divided by worshiping on this or that mountain, but we do our best to offer whatever we have to see that God's people, God's kids, might fall the right way. Every Friday night, kids from age 5 to about 25 arrive to skate. They get a hot meal. They hear the word. They skate some more, take a a bag of food home to fill those empty cupboards. And since February, we've welcomed over 325 skaters. And we've served as a mission training site for over 60 young YWAMers out in Lakeside. We glean ripe fields. They are ripe for the harvest. These are not the kids who will show up to church on Sunday. And many, like Ruth, are working the weekends to glean what they can for their families to simply survive. These skaters are often neglected and they're traumatized. They're rendered invisible for a time by poverty and youth. They are the grain on the edges of the field. They're forgotten masses that max out the resources of schools to little avail. They know of pathway treatment, we call it Pathways Treatment Center, Medical Center in Kalispell. They know nothing of Glacier National Park. They've never been. Their best day is spending hours in the summer sunshine skating at Woodland Park. That's where we have our outdoor skate center. And there's no stadiums. There's no parents cheering on their kids there. No crowds celebrating their athletic feats as they ride on their skateboards. These are the invisible of Kalispell and the Flathead Valley. And they only show up on the radars of school counselors and CPS and emergency responders. And yet all year long in rain, sun, snow, and more snow, they make it through the week to come to Juju. 
And on the Friday, his father punched him in the face. Jeremy confessed, when I skate, I'm free. When I skate, I'm free. And they skate beautifully. For our skaters and immigrants like Ruth, our towns in Montana can feel very dangerous. Beginning in verse 8, Boaz says to Ruth, Have you under, Haven't you understood, my daughter? Don't glean in another field. Don't go anywhere else. Instead, stay here with my young women. Keep your eye on the field so that they, that they are harvesting. And go along after them. I have ordered the young men not to assault you. And then Ruth bowed down with her face to the ground and replies to Boaz, How is it that I have found favor in your eyes that you notice me? I am an immigrant. Everybody knows their two strikes. We are gleaning on the edge. A young man about 21 years old who grew up in Sirius Juju came to our first Tuesday skate of the winter. Tony is a proud young father of a baby girl whom I met at our skate competition last July. And last month, Tony brought the next generation to Juju. He also brought his seventh grade nephew and his, I think it's, five-year-old nephew. Tony revealed he is determined to be nothing like his father, whom he watched assault and batter his mother for 15 years. He refuses to become violent. Instead, he's determined to raise a strong, resilient, confident daughter free of past pain. England is somebody else to pray for. She helped me pack food bags the other day, and she said, my family didn't always have food in the house until I was 12, and my mother married my stepdad. He hunts. And during one-on-one mentoring last spring, Ezra spoke about being molested for years by a friend of the family. He was nine at the time. But what he cannot seem to forgive is that he could not prevent the same abuse happening to his younger brother. Last, uh, about two months ago, we had four skaters celebrate a birthday at Juju. These kids were 16, 17, 18, and 20, coming in for a birthday party. They skated to the Lion King, if you can imagine. And they laughed and laughed and goofed off. They were kids again for a moment. Now, the birthday boy lost his mother in a horrific, fiery car accident about a summer ago. Another fears that his mother will lose custody and be imprisoned for meth. The third has a brother in prison for life and no support from her family, though she is now in her second year at our local community college and plans to become a parole officer and an addiction counselor. For a moment, that Thursday afternoon in the warehouse, these were kids again. And each week, Juju is their family, their sanctuary, their home. But meanwhile, in our story, Jesus returns, Jesus' disciples, they return home with food that they have purchased from the city. The city that they resented even having to stop in and enter in the first place. They did this dissatisfying task of going into the bad neighborhood to bring Jesus food. And Jesus will at least be grateful, won't he? Rabbi, eat, they say, gesturing and unwrapping the food. And then he says, I have food you know nothing about. Now, did someone go and bring him food? They're asking one another. While we were gone, seriously? And while the disciples were famished and frustrated, Jesus was eating the most satisfying meal by doing the work he was sent to do. So pointing to the fields around the well, Jesus marvels, can't you see it? The fields are ripe for the harvest. The woman who survives by keeping to herself suddenly enters her town and breaks her silence. She is full of joy, overflowing to life, and she gladly pours out her story to everyone in the town who will listen to her. Come and see the man who's told me everything I've ever done. And I know if I was a townsperson... And I heard from the woman in the well say, he's heard, he's told me everything I've ever done. I'd say, really? What is everything you've ever done? Tell me about that. Now her witness would fall flat if she simply gave the safe truth, right? But instead she chooses to be truly honest because the town who has ignored her now asks her to lead the way to Jesus. 
And because of her preaching, they are curious and interested to see for themselves. Meeting him, Jesus takes up their offer to make home among them two extra days. Abide with me. Jesus abides with two strike people two extra days. Many more believed, we're told. And speaking to the unspeakable woman, the town makes its own confession of faith. It says, we no longer believe because of what you said. We believe because we heard for ourselves and know that truly this is the Savior of the world. Jesus points to the fields around the well and tells his disciples, everyone who looks at these fields will tell you, wait another four months, perhaps longer in Helena, until the harvest. But I tell you, Jesus says to us today, I tell you, open your eyes. The fields of people in Samaria are ripe for the harvest. They are worth our delay. They're worth our time. The fields of people in Helena are ripe for the harvest. Many have been left on the edges to rot. They're worth our delay, and they're worth our time. I believe juju is worth our time. I believe it can be the work of the whole presbytery. And you too, I'm looking over at Rose, who gives so faithfully to juju and many others. If this ministry inspires you, pray for us. Take a card on your way out after you've had some coffee. Put it in the hands of a skater you might see or a grandkid who might travel out our way. Come, stay with us the next time you come out to the Flathead Valley. Maybe you want to be an investor in this ministry. But I want to say, regardless of that, don't forget to look around you today. Where are the fields ripe for the harvest here? You want to look at those edges. Look at what's fallen to the ground, only needing to be gleaned by the God of Ruth. Allow yourself to get to know two strike people you and I pass by all the time. Doing so will change us. I can say it's changed me for the good. Take a detour and follow Jesus off the map. Stay where Jesus tells you to abide. The harvest will be surprising and that wasted time, my friends, it'll be worth every minute. Thanks be to God. Amen. Amen.